Hello and welcome to episode two of the Doha Daily, coming to you from the Qatari capital. I'm Scott McIntyre alongside Paul Williams and Mr. Michael Church, where we've just witnessed the opening match of the 2022 FIFA World Cup. A very disappointing result for Qatar, who lost 2-0 to Ecuador, both goals coming via Ana Valencia in the first half. Michael coming to you first this was obviously it goes without saying not the result mm. um, that Qatar wanted it's not the result that the host nation wanted mm. it's probably not the result that the World Cup wanted I imagine there's a lot of happy um, uh, Ecuadorian um, fans we certainly saw many of those actually inside the stadium and, and obviously back home in South America as well um, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the game itself mm. this was the first time that, uh, that a host nation has lost their opening match at a World Cup, so a history of not the kind that um, that Qatar wanted to create. In one way, it may feed into some of the the criticism. We will get into the game and the nitty gritty of it. But how um, how big a, a a pendulum swing is this for for the World Cup as a whole that that the host has lost first up? Yeah, it's unquestionably a bit of a kick for the tournament, and from a negative perspective, um, you really want the host nation to be as strong as possible and starting the competition as well as possible and to be going in with Qatar with their lack of a World Cup pedigree as well definitely not helping the situation that's gonna it's gonna unfortunately generate I think a lot of negative headlines and a lot of negative publicity. Paul the game itself uh, there was an early moment where it seemed that Ecuador had taken the lead that goal was um, overturned by VAR with some um, new technology semi-automation being yes. involved there as well so the first time we saw that they only had to wait three minutes uh, for that and then we saw the penalty and then the second goal thereafter and you, and you got the sense that things were probably lost almost mm. um, at that point uh, I, th- I think Qatar looked really rusty um, tonight they looked to me uh, like a nation that hadn't had mm. their players playing competitive football for, for many months which they hadn't uh, what was your uh, reading and, and take on the performance from Qatar it was a pretty dire performance I and mean, then we had this discussion in the um, the media center after the game as to was it uh, rustiness was it deer in the headlight stuff I think it's a combination of of both they didn't start the game well I think that that goal that was ultimately disallowed you could tell it rattled them a little bit that they were just completely put off their game and they they never recovered they never recovered Saad Al Sheeb had a nightmare in goal he was at fault for that first disallowed goal he then conceded the penalty he was hesitant in coming out for the ball conceded the penalty and hit a disastrous first 45 minutes and as you said it was only 2-0 which we know can be overturned in football mm. relatively easily but you got the sense that Two 0 after what thirty odd minutes, and you it's game over. There's, there was no way that Qatar was was coming back. They were um, demoralised, and it was a, a disappointing way for the host nation to to start the tournament. They had the chance probably on half time to get themselves back into it. Had they taken that chance, perhaps they could have turned the tide in the second half. But there, there was no coming back for them once they went two down. Michael, for you, tactically, were there were there any elements that you picked up um, or you saw? One, one thing that I thought was quite unusual was um, we know Akram Afif is, is the fulcrum of the team, the creative heartbeat of the team. Whether it was him being frustrated, whether it was an instruction from the sideline, we saw him dropping very deep. Um, at, at, at multiple points, actually, throughout the game, he was, he was the deepest defender in the defensive line. And, I mean, there's dropping and picking up the ball and trying to get involved, and then there's uh, you know being five um, metres from the keeper as the last man in the line. Um, uh, two minutes later, he, he was out on the left. He was drifting centrally. I understand the, the need and the want to get your playmakers on the ball, but I just thought the, the creative um, freedom, whether it was from him, the coach, it, it just seemed a little bit um, disjointed. I just got the feeling that right from the very first whistle, they were completely rattled. I just got the impression that all game plans went out the window. I just got that sense of a team that looked nervous, a team that looked uncertain, a team that looked overwhelmed by the occasion. And certainly... You know, looking at the, at the quotes that Felix Sanchez came out with um, in the post-match press conference, his feeling was very much that the occasion got to his players, got to the team, and I think, you know, it was it was a it was a look it was it was a difficult scenario for these players coming in. Many of them have been building up for the last twelve years, not just the country, but them as players, them as as kids being told as they go through the Aspire Academy that this is what they're devel- being developed for. It comes to fruition. They're on the biggest stage in the world, and they choked. 
Paul, it doesn't get easier from here. This was supposed to be the easiest match yeah. on paper for the Qataris. Is there, of course, there's six points still up for grabs, but um, mm. they're probably the hardest six points. Is there a way you can see Qatar turning this around and progressing through to the next stage? I think if there were any chance to get out of the group, they had to get something out of this game. They've got the Netherlands and Senegal to come, which on paper were the, the two most difficult games in um, in their group. And I think that the way that they got beaten tonight, so comprehensively beaten, their morale will be so low to try and pick that up again in three days' time um, to face, I think it's Netherlands they've got in, uh, in their next game. Um, it's going to be mightily difficult. That's a tough challenge for Felix Sanchez to try and get the team back up for an even bigger challenge again and try and get something out of that game. I struggle to see them now recovering from that. It feels like a, a loss that is going to be a hammer blow for their chances. All right, we're a bit more pessimistic than some of the fans were. We spoke to a few of them after the game, uh, including um, some that were happy to sing and dance about, about the whole situation. So let's uh, have a look at what they had to say. So um, tonight's uh, result, it's disappointing for Qatar, but, but how do you feel? Uh, disappointed, of course. We do it better. We cannot have better than this circumstance. We've been preparing for this, home soil, team prepared, not good. And this was supposed to be the easiest game. Uh, but uh, let's hope for the best. We, we cannot lose hope. Yeah, yeah, we are a little disappointed, but um, we are happy that we've had this uh, match in Qatar and that we uh, celebrated the ceremony too. So. Uh, to, to, tonight, guys, uh, what is your thought about this, uh, this match and this result? Amazing atmosphere. Uh, stadium is beautiful, as you can see. Uh, incredible opening act. Unfortunately, we lost. But uh, this is football. It's uh, you win and you lose. And, yeah. This was such a, a big game, the first game of the tournament. Yeah. Maybe a match that people thought Qatar uh, could win. Yeah. Uh, does, does this mean now that there's no chance for Qatar to qualify? Or, or are you guys confident that you can still qualify uh, from the remaining two matches? No, anything can happen in football. And uh, I'm still hopeful that we can win. Yeah. And, uh, we will try our best, of course, and we will keep supporting. I saw Ecuador; it was the best because, I, I, you know, this uh, all these fans for Qatar they make some like pressure for the team. But I, I saw before the, the team, the Qatar team, it was fantastic. But today some pressure from the fans so, swear, like but, but but you guys the team was preparing for uh, you know many many months yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but because you know because uh, they have some some pressure from the people uh, some pressure from the the from qatar qatar people yeah they they have to win so it's make some and it's like it's came pressure for them so um firstly what was your thoughts on the result and and the match tonight I was obviously really sad that our country lost, but congratulations to Ecuador. But was it a surprise? Because, I mean, there was so much uh, expectation in the country that you guys were going to start good, but uh, what, what, what went wrong? Honestly, I don't know. I thought we were going to win. I'm not going to lie. I feel like our, our team worked hard. I feel like I've seen them play better. I feel like they have it in them. Maybe they were nervous. Maybe it was the nerves and the pressure that got to them. But I do believe they, they are better and they could play better than this. For you as a fan, how, how exciting was it to, to finally have the football here? It's so exciting. I was so happy. I couldn't sleep yesterday. Really? Yeah. yeah. Are, are you confident that the team can... You have two more matches, of course, that, yeah. that you can return the result and, and maybe still progress? Hopefully. That's, that's what I'm thinking. Hopefully that, that the next two matches can make us... Uh, Go to, for, to the round of 16, yeah. hopefully. Welcome to Qatar. Thank you, guys. Yeah, so still plenty of optimism amongst the local fans as Qatar looks ahead to their next match in a couple of days. We just want to say once again that our coverage is brought to you by SMC, an industry leader in advertising, media and sales. Guys, let's look ahead now to the next item on the agenda for us at the Asian Game, which is tomorrow Iran making their tournament bow against England. Michael, this is um, obviously a very tough match. The one that mm. Iran really will be circling that they need to get something out of if they're, you know, likely to progress through the group. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's one of the most fascinating games from an Asian perspective during this World Cup. I think we get to see 
arguably the, the, the most interesting team that we have in Asia with the personalities mm, and the mm. and the and the the coaching ability of Carlos Queiroz mm. up against uh, a team that always fancies its chances and is always very uh, its media is very vocal in terms of their their abilities and their capabilities and their possibilities and their potential. Um, so let's see. It's going to be it's going to be interesting. I'm really looking forward to it tomorrow. This is another match. I guess one of the, the real matches that that's drawn a lot of off the field attention as well. There's been a lot of talk. Um, Iran have got to score first, but but should they should they score in this match? You know, will they celebrate? Will they won't? Are there divisions within the team? Is there harmony? Do you see that being any form of um, of a factor tomorrow? And and are we going to see celebrations if Iran do score, or or is it going to be more muted? I think it'll be muted. I'd be surprised unless it's someone like Mehdi Tarabi or Vahid Damiri who score. Then mm-hmm. we could be in for. Uh, a little bit of fun. It might be a little bit more than celebration if they uh, if they do score, and that could be some some controversy in itself. I, I I suspect if it's not one of those players, the the celebrations will be muted. I don't think there'll be any singing of the national anthem. It is a really interesting um, backstory to to this game. Of course, there's this game. There's the uh, U.S. versus Iran game as well, which is probably the one that most people have got circled more so mm. than this one against England. But of course, they're both interesting from a football and a mm. geopolitical. Mm. Mm point of view especially with with what's going on in in Iran at the moment so it'll be fascinating I don't know if I think that Iran necessarily have to get something out of this game this is no doubt their their toughest game in this group I think it's the Wales and the USA games that they'll be circling and they're the games that they think certainly I think against the USA they should go into that game strongly thinking that they can get the three points Um, and then if they can pick up something against Wales as well that could be potentially be enough to get out, if they get anything against England, for me, that's a bonus. We know with Carlos Carras, the, the approach is always going to be a, a defensively oriented one. Do you see that there's a way that they can hold, I mean, this England team, which has a wealth of creative and attacking talent? Never say never with a Kirosh team. He's done it before. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's not forget 2014, they came up against Argentina and a certain Lionel Messi. Yep. And they almost held them out until, what, 85th minute or something, and, and Messi curled in a, a blinder from from the edge of the penalty box so they've got it within their arsenal to mm. do so I was talking to an English journalist today who wasn't particularly optimistic about their chances certainly thinks they'll get through the group but certainly not as a contender to go deep as they have in in the last World Cup and of course in, in the Euros as well so I think Kirosh has got it in his arsenal to do that with this Iran team I'm not sure that they will but certainly within their capability to do so former Manchester United coach has it in his arsenal I see I see very much what you did there what you did there Um, Michael for you um, optimism pessimism can and I guess more importantly should the aim be for Iran to hold them or should they be um, Mm. going out with with perhaps some greater uh, objectives than that I think if uh, Iran were to pick when they were going to play England, this was the time mm. they want to play them. They want mm. to play them in their first game, potentially catch them cold. They're coming in like 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 all the teams that have uh, players based in the Premier League, La Liga. They're literally coming in off having played just a week ago, mm. um, so they've not necessarily had the same time together to be able to develop their mm. game and work. They could catch them cold. But Kiros' teams are always well organised. They're yeah. always disciplined yeah. and they'll hit them on the break. Let's see. Yeah, it should be a fascinating game. Michael, thanks for your time. Paul, thanks for your time. We will be back tomorrow to review all the action from that game and look ahead to the upcoming games involving the half a dozen uh, AFC nations that are participating here in Qatar. But to take you out tonight, we wanted to give you another little uh, flavour and taste of uh, the local culture and, and some of the activities that are going on throughout the country this is a, um, a guy down by the Bay Area playing uh, an oud, one of the um, instruments uh, that is uh, traditional and often heard throughout the Middle Eastern region. That's all for now. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.